In Jesus' name, amen. I believe in the separation of church and state. And I believe in the separation of church and state, not only because of the First Amendment and because of what Thomas Jefferson said, but I believe in the separation of church and state because I believe that the church would do a terrible job of running the state. And I believe that the state would even do a worse job at running the church. These are two separate, separate kingdoms. And they're interested in two different, two different things, two different areas. The government is interested in power, prestige. The church is interested in such things as forgiveness, salvation, eternal life. And so politics should stay political. Religion should stay religious. In addition to that, when it comes to politics and religion, we've all heard the saying, when you're in polite company, don't talk about what? Those two things, right? Don't talk about politics and religion. That's because pretty much everyone has strongly held political views and pretty much everyone has strong religious views. So what is surprising at the beginning of our reading today is that the political and the religious team up against Jesus. The Herodians and the Pharisees team up against Jesus. The first word, the Herodians. By their name, you can see that they support Herod, Herod Antipas, the son of the one of the Herod who tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. Herodians supported politically Herod, and that meant that they were big Rome people, big Rome supporters, because Herod was a Rome supporter. Herod had named his capital city Tiberius, and he named Tiberius, Tiberius after Tiberius Caesar. Herodians, big Herod supporters, which meant they were big supporters of Rome. And they have real issues with Jesus because just a few days earlier, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people hailed Jesus as the king of Israel. Well, the Herodians know there's only one king. There's only going to be one king. It's not Jesus. It's going to be Herod. And so that's, that's their issue with Jesus. Now, the, 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 the religious world, the religious, the strong, those who had strongly held religious views were the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were known for keeping a lot of laws, more than they needed to be kept, especially the Sabbath day laws, and not working on the Sabbath day. And they had issues with Jesus they, because his disciples had just picked the head off some wheat as they were walking through the field, a field one day, and they said, that's work because it's harvesting. And Jesus healed some people on the Sabbath day. They said that was work. And Jesus really, they really had a problem with Jesus because Jesus said, you know, all of you guys are, are resting on the Sabbath. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath day is about finding your rest in me. And the true religion isn't about all your works. It's about me. I'm here. The Son of God in the flesh. And the, and, and the true work is trusting in me for your life and salvation. So he takes all their works away. The political world, the religious world, team up against Jesus. Now, the political world and the religious world are still suspect of Jesus to this day. Now, I don't know how much they're teaming up, even though in the book of Revelation it says that they do. 
They're just suspect. The political world is always suspect of, of Jesus because he had said that the, political, that the political world wouldn't have any power at all unless his father granted it to them. And then later on um, in the book of Acts, Peter says that we must always obey God rather than man. So we're always answering to someone higher than government. And the religious world is always suspect of Jesus because the religious world always thinks it's about their works. And Jesus is always saying, nope, it's about me and my works. It's about me and my perfect life. It's about me and my perfect death, my perfect resurrection, and faith in me. So even to this day, the political world, the religious world is, is suspect of Jesus. But anyway, these two, the political world, the religious world, those who have strongly held political views, those who have strongly held religious views, team up to trap Jesus. And this is the question that they come up with. And, here, and, and they mess up, in my opinion, because it's overly sweet. They put too much sugar in the coffee. Here it is. Here it is. Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay, pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, despite the fact that it's way too sweet, the, the, the question itself is rather clever. Because Jesus is in trouble no matter how he answers it. If Jesus says, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, well, he comes off as a religious rebel against Herod and against Rome. I mean, if you're not paying taxes, that, that, that's, 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 pure, that's pure rebellion. And that means that Jesus is basically saying, if I was king, you wouldn't be paying all these taxes. Things would be better. And so the, the, the Herodians couldn't have that. And remember, by the way, um, what, what the sign was above Jesus when he was crucified. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Well, there's only one king, like I said, and that's Herod. So Jesus can't say, don't pay taxes to Caesar. On the other hand, if Jesus says, yes, pay taxes to Caesar, he gets in trouble with the religious world because no true Messiah of Israel will say, pay taxes to a government who set itself up in, in Jerusalem. You can't you can't have a foreign you can't have a foreign um, you can't be you can't have a foreign power and be supporting a foreign power in in if you are a a, a child of Israel. Remember remember that Jesus got into a tr lot of trouble because what did he do? He ate he ate and drank with sinners and tax collectors. For them, tax collectors and sinners are the same thing. So Jesus can't say, yes, pay taxes to sinners. So Jesus looks like he is trapped, but this is the way he finds out of the trap. He says, who has a coin? Somebody reaches in, out of the pocket, grabs a, grabs a denarius, grabs a coin, and says, and Jesus says, whose likeness and inscription is on it? And they say, Caesar's. And so Jesus says, Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Render unto God that which is God's. And then after that, the, the religious and the political, they, they all went away, the Herodians and the Pharisees, marveling at Jesus. Now, 
this is more than Jesus getting out of a trap and having a clever saying. This is about us. Because we live in both kingdoms. We live in a very political world. We live in a very political kingdom right now. This last week, a Supreme Court nominee was grilled by senators because um, she's, she was appointed to the Supreme Court or, or, or nominated to the Supreme Court. This last week on Thursday, President Trump was on one station and on the other station was Vice President Biden, both getting questions by people. And it's only, we're only going to get more political in the next few weeks. We live in a religious world. We have our faith. So what should we do? We should render unto God that which is God's. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Render unto Caesar. Take the coin out of your pocket and look at it. Who's Whose image is on that coin? Well, all kinds of images, right? All kinds of images of people who have kept us free and, and contributed to the freedom of the country in which we live in now. Such as, you know, Abraham Lincoln, Washington, so forth. What are the inscriptions? Well, the inscriptions are in God we trust, means we, we, we trust in God more than the coin. It means that also that, that we have certain rights, inalienable rights, that have been given to us by our Creator, not by government. The coin also has the inscription, um, E Pluribus Unum, out of many one. That means that out of many, out of all of us who come from different backgrounds, that we form one nation. It means that, that we, we, we kind of care for our neighbors because, you know, all these people from different backgrounds. And, yeah, we're not different backgrounds as much as we are from different backgrounds. We are one. And then the other word is liberty. We have freedom. We have the freedom given to us in the Constitution and more. They're not all enumerated, right? We have the freedom to vote. We have the freedom to, we have the freedom to not vote. We have the freedom to, to speak. We have all those freedoms. And so we render unto Caesar our liberty and we live free. But Jesus also says, render unto God that which is God's. Now that's a little tougher because what is God's? We can't pull a coin on your pocket. Whose image is on you, right? In Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the image we were created. In the image, God created man in his own image. In the image he created him, male and female, he created them. We were created in the image of God. And I know we, that, that image has been dimmed and dulled by sin, an original sin. But still, originally, created in God's image. And, and after Noah got off the ark, God said, don't go murdering people because people were created in, the, in my image. We were created in the image of God. And as much as we lost that, we've been, that image has begun to be renewed in us because of our baptism. And we bear, bear the inscription that we have been, um, that we um, have belonged to Christ the crucified. That's what's inscripted on us. We have the sign of the cross both upon our forehead and upon our heart in our baptism to mark us as ones redeemed by Christ the crucified. And so we belong to God. Render unto God that which is God's, yourself, your heart, your body, your soul, your mind. Not, and not just when we're doing this, not just when we gather together for worship, but everywhere, at home, at work, everything. Thoughts, your words, your deeds. 
Render yourself unto God. You can't do that perfectly. You can do it, not perfectly. Jesus knows that. Your Heavenly Father knows that. That's why Jesus came to this earth to be the coin of the kingdom. He came down from heaven and he lived perfectly for us. He died perfectly for us. He is everything that we need to be. And so, he is the coin in God's kingdom. He's the greatest coin. He's the greatest coin. Because, yes, we should render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. But where is literal Caesar in that coin? Can you even find a denarius these days? I know there's some floating around somewhere in museums. But that's not the coin, the coin in Caesar, Caesar's world because Caesar doesn't exist. Literal Caesar does not exist. But Christ does because he is risen. He is risen indeed. He's going to have a kingdom without end. We look forward to that. And in the religious kingdom, well, Christ is our coin. Because it's not about our works. Yes, we do have to carry out some good works to, to our neighbor. But the true works, the best works, the salvation works, are Christ and his dying and rising and living perfectly for us. Christ is our coin. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.